He is a licensed ma marriage and family therapist and a partner at the Family Center of South DeKalb. And he's lectured, written journal articles and book chapters, and conducted seminars and workshops in the US and internationally on issues of mental health and culture. Dr. Akaniela is also currently associate professor at Georgia State University, Department of African American Studies, and has taught courses on African American families and issues in the African American community. Previously, he taught at Pacific Oaks College in Pasadena, California, and he serves on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Narrative Therapy and Community Work and the Journal of Systemic Therapy. His education was at Columbia, where, at Emory University, where he earned a PhD in Family and Human Development in 1996, at Pacific Oaks, where he earned a Master's in Marriage, Family, and Child Counseling, and at Cal State in Northridge, for a, where he received his Bachelor's in Pan-African Studies in Journalism. He's published extensively on a wide variety of topics, presented uh, paper presentations at the annual conference of the National Council for Black Studies, and has been the keynote speaker and offered workshops in the US, Canada, and Australia. Dr. Akiniela. Y'all ever heard the term TMI? Yeah. You know, somebody spends too much time on Google. <laughs> How's everybody doing? I'm, I've got seven minutes too, right? Okay, okay. I don't know if I can do as well as you did, but we're going to do seven minutes. I want to talk, put this, this whole conversation today in the context of, first of all, culture and family, but in particular talking about the idea of dignity. As I've been listening to our conversations all day long, um, that, that idea of dignity has come up, come to me again and again and again, because I believe that in just about any situation in which we're, which, which we're struggling against a mil mental illness, that ultimately a person is trying to hold on to dignity, right? Trying to hold on to that sense of self and that sense that they are respected and respectable in their communities. <clears throat> The work that I do is largely in uh, an international therapeutic community called narrative therapy. In particular, uh, the work that I do, I call it testimony. And for folks who lived here in the South for a while, we're not talking about uh, going to court, <laughs> right? At least in my community, when somebody has a testimony, that's a spiritual question. That's, that's a cultural question. And so we talk about testimony and testifying. That's telling a story. And ultimately, internationally, the whole idea of narrative is that we constitute our lives through storytelling. You know, it's, it's not about just being able to diagnose a problem with the person, but it's the story that the person has about themselves as well as the story that they want to tell about themselves. And ultimately, our struggle is a struggle to have a good what? Testimony. Does that make sense to anybody out there? All right. Um, this testimony therapy that I talk about, of course, is grounded in the African American community, but I believe that there are correlates internationally and cross-culturally with what we're talking about. First of all, as I want to particularly talk to people who are doing mental health work. Who are the mental health workers out there? This, this is particularly for us because I think the other message that has come across today is that there, there is too little work being done around this particular problem. Am I right? And so we need to think about how we do that work. So first of all, in, in the work that I do, I want to privilege the knowledge that the storyteller has about his or her life. It becomes very important for me, if I'm working with the person who's struggling with BPD, that I privilege the knowledge that they have about their lives. If they say they're hurting, if they say they're angry, if they say they're upset, I want to what? Believe that. I think one of our speakers this morning said that they don't allow that word, um, what's the word? Manipulation. Manipulation. And, and I, I do the same thing with my staff, you know, because I'm a manipulator. Manipulation is not a problem. We all do it. It just means, you know, when, you know, when my children were 16 and they were trying to figure ways to get out of the house on the weekend, they manipulated me, right? When I want to buy something that I know that we can't afford and I talk to my wife and convince her and I do something nice for her, I'm manipulating her. So manipulation is not the problem. You know, and, and, and so we want to privilege the knowledge that the storyteller, the person who's telling this story, who's giving this testimony, has about themselves. And then this is most importantly, I think, from what I want to talk about today. I assume uh, a communitarian relational psychology. 
That's as opposed to what Michael White used to call an internal state psychology. And that becomes very important. Communitarian uh, psychology assumes, first of all, using an African idea of the self. I am because we are. And because we are, therefore I am. As opposed to that old Discardian thing, I think, therefore I am. In other words, I don't exist in my head. I exist in the relationship between myself and yourself. That's where I find myself. And that takes us up to this question, what happens when there is no sense of self? What happens when the connect between myself, me and you, seems broken? If I'm always in struggle looking for a relationship, but it never seems to be there. And so for us mental health workers, it becomes important, first of all, to, un to, to, to have this idea that our clients, our, our consumers, don't exist in their heads. They exist in that relationship between us and them, between them and their families, between them and their coworkers, wherever it might be, that's where that person exists. And our biggest work is to help people rebuild those bridges in relationship. Um, everybody wants to be known by somebody and everybody wants to know that somebody allows them to know them. You know, I tell folks, that's why, you know, when I was a little kid, I used to like to read the King James Bible, you know, especially in Genesis, where it would say Adam knew his wife, and by the time I could read, I knew what knew his wife meant. <laughs> you know, I said, oh, wait, that's the good parts, right? I understood that, but what that idea of known, to know someone, that's, that's a level of intimacy. Each of our struggles every day is to know and to be known. It's not enough just to know somebody else. You want to know that somebody knows you. You want to know that somebody, even when you screw up, you can say to them, oh, you know how I am. And they'll say, yeah, I know how you are. What's it like when a person, when it seems nobody knows you? Nobody accepts you. What I'm asking for here is what some of us older, older therapists probably learned about as being having empathy for our clients having a sense of empathy for who they are, that becomes an important thing also. And finally, you know, as I, one of the things that I've heard consistently through this day is in, 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 in the literature, there's a lot of talk in terms of BPB about the question of shame. I want to flip the script a little bit on that and, and talk about culturally what does that mean. In the culture that I come from, shame is actually not a bad thing. You know, I come from a shame culture. I come from a culture where my mother and my father, when I went out, said, you know, don't bring shame on this house. Don't forget what your name is. Don't forget who you are when you're out in the street. That's, that, they, they were instilling a sense of shame on me. In other words, shame is about my relationship, how my behavior impacts those who I'm related to. I want to argue that what we often see in people who, who are struggling with uh, uh, BPD is not so much shame as it is embarrassment. You see, shame is always relational, and it's, shame is generally about something that the wider community accepts as this is a good, uh, not a good thing that you do. Embarrassment is, it doesn't have to be connected to the wider community. It's, I feel naked, or I came out of the bathroom and there was some tissue hanging out the back of my belt. <laughs> Right now, people are going to laugh just like you did. But once I see the tissue, what do I feel? I feel embarrassed. I feel what's it like to live a life where it seems almost at every moment you have all eyes on you. You have no clothes on and you're embarrassed. What's that like to have that kind of experience? Right. What's it like, particularly if you come from a cultural context in which your whole sense of identity is on what? Having that relationship. You find you in the relationship. And now that relationship is what? Broken off because all eyes are laughing at you or all the eyes are judging you because of who you are, not because of what you've done to others, but because of who you are. That's a powerful thing. Finally, what, what I, I think it's important to allow people to tell their stories, I use what are called the four healing questions. Um, and these questions are important for helping a person find their testimony, find their story. You know, I, I think it's important for either family members or the person who is directly struggling with BPD to be able to tell a story. First of all, every story has to have a context, right? And so no matter what has happened to a person, and um, it, no matter 
when we want to look at it, an important question to ask a person is, what happened to you? Somebody might start that story off by talking about being molested as a child. Somebody might start that story off by talking about how, well, last week, um, my husband didn't buy the flowers that I wanted him to buy me, and so I know now that he really hates me. He really doesn't respect me, and I'm really upset about that. Or it might be the husband saying, hey, you know what? I bought the flower, you know, I bought some flowers the week before, so why is she upset with me? That's what happened to me. The next question I want to know as that story starts being unfolding is, how does what happened to you affect you now? I want to know, what, what are, the, what are the, the context and the implications of this event that's happened in your life, sometimes over and over and over again? Well, I really feel hurt because I don't believe that person loves me, or I really feel hurt because that person keeps making me the problem over and over again, or I'm really sad, or I'm really angry, or I can't talk to that person right now, or I wish that person would talk to me and it hurts me. That's the context of how this thing has impacted your life. And then thirdly, this is a very important question. What gives you the strength to carry on? You know, oftentimes when people are struggling with, with any kind of mental illness, either as the person who is struggling directly with it or as a family member, they forget sometimes that they're still here. They forget sometimes that they have carried on. They forget sometimes that, wow, I'm sitting here in a therapist's office as opposed to on a hospital bed somewhere or in a morgue somewhere. Something has helped me to get to this place. It's, called, it's that question of hopefulness. Um, which I think begins to challenge one of the other things that I think happens when people are struggling against BPD, that sense of despair. Uh, someone else said earlier this morning that it's, it's, we're talking about more than depression. And as I think about what's more than depression, it's despair, it's nihilism. It's a, that sense of emptiness. How many folks have heard, heard their clients say, I just feel empty. I, I just don't feel like anywhere or anybody that sense of despair that happens, but hey, you know what, you're here now. How did you get here? What's helped you to hold on? That can become a powerful question. And then the final question that I ask is I try to help a person create their testimony. I believe ultimately that our work has to be not only client-centered, but it has to be client-directed. I believe that people can be experts in their own lives. And so the question becomes, what do you need to heal? What I'm asking a person there is, what's your theory of change? Let's work from your theory of change. What, what, what will happen that will look like something different in your life? Those are, just, those are steps in helping a person create a testimony, create a story for themselves. It gives us an outline, a, a story that they're hoping will happen. It gives us a connection and a work to have with them. And by now, I think my seven minutes are up. And so I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much.